Jinpei messed around a bit with the key he had, looked blankly at the picture. What's the deal with this picture, anyway? Santa had only been mumbling to himself, but drew Lotus' attention. She looked at, the, at it and paused. I think I've seen this picture before. Where? In a book. There's a British biochemist named Sheldrake. He has a rather interesting theory. I saw this picture in his book. What's this interesting theory? A morphogenetic field, which requires on the theory of which relies on the theory of morphic resonance. Man, I can't deal with this. Just listening to you talk is giving me a headache. Santa put his head put his hands on his head as though he were in pain. Lotus just arched her brows. It's not a difficult concept to grasp. In essence, he states the shapes of living organisms and their behavioral patterns are transmitted through a field not visible to the eye. Uh, what part of that isn't difficult exactly? Lotus didn't look pleased. Then how about this? Theory of telepathic mechanism. Telepathy. Yeah, telepathy. Well, perhaps not exactly telepathy, but, uh, close enough for a simple approximation. <laughs> are you serious? Telepathy. Who do you think we are, kids from the 70s? I can't believe someone would actually do serious research on stuff like that. I agree. Lotus was surprisingly curt. Jinpei had expected at least some conflict. I read the book, but I can hardly say I understood it. I'm in no position to defend or condemn anything. It was probably just someone latching onto a statistical outlier from some study and turning it into a ridiculous theory. Such is common with a lot of studies, really. There's no scientific merit to any of it, I'm sure. But even still, I... I saw a picture like this one in the book. After a moment, she walked up to the picture, examined it. What do you think this picture looks like? Santa answered first. What do you mean? Isn't it just, like, abstract or something like that? It's black and white scribbles. There's no meaning. That's it. What about you, Junpei? Does it look like anything? Um... No, you get a bunch of answers here. There's only one that matters, though. A Funyarinpa. See? I mean, this totally looks like one. Here, and, uh, here. Jinpei indicated parts of the picture looked exactly like the other parts. After three seconds of silence, Lotus looked at Jinpei. What the hell is a Funyarinpa? What do you mean, what the hell is a Funyarinpa? You mean you don't know? How the hell would I know? How could you not know? That's... That's practically blasphemous! Say you're sorry! Apologize to the Funyarimpa! Goodness, you're such a rude woman! Another three seconds of awkward silence. Lotus opened her mouth as she shook. <sighs> Jinpei, are you screwing around? Forget it. I'm just gonna tell you. This is a dog. Believe it or not, the Funyarimpa is a, uh, a meme within 999. <laughs> a very popular meme. See, like this. Lotus pointed out the parts of the picture. She did have a point. It was a dog. Canonically, actually. What the person who made this specific picture did back in the day was they took an old black and white photograph of their pet pug and then transcribed only, only the darker sides of it into ink blot. So uh, now we know what it's a picture of, but I don't see that how, how that helps us. Lotus nodded. A TV show from Great Britain did an experiment. They took two similar pictures. Both of them were hard to identify initially, but once you figured out the answer, you couldn't see anything else. The first was a woman wearing a hat. The other, to make it easier. Let's just say it was this picture of a dog. It wasn't, by the way, but feel free to look it up yourself. This is an actual study that happened. 
so their experiment. They sent the pictures to other parts of the world where British radio and television didn't reach. To Ireland, the US, Africa, Europe. Then in each, they gathered a number of test subjects. All in all, there were maybe a thousand people. These 1,000 people were shown the two pictures and asked, what does this picture look like? The results in and of themselves weren't terribly interesting. 9.2% saw the lady. 3.9% the dog. Then in two days, they broadcast a new show. During the 30-minute program, they broadcast the dog picture and the solution. The audience was estimated to be 200,000. Afterward... It could be assumed the number of people who knew it to be about the same amount, maybe a little more. Two days passed again, and they gathered subjects from areas where the British TV and radio didn't exist. This time, they were only able to find a sample of roughly 850. None of them were people who had participated in the first test. They were given the same test and the same two pictures. The results were shocking. 10% saw the lady. The previous test of 9.2 resulted in a change that wasn't statistically significant, but the dog picture... The percentage rose to 6.8%, almost double. You realize the significance? There was no way the second group could have seen the picture. They lived so far from Britain and couldn't have seen it. And yet, the success rate had increased. Why? How did that happen? What does it mean? Lotus looked back and forth, from Junpei to Santa and back. Normally calm and collected, she looked as though she were nearly possessed, like there was something manic about her manner. Santa took a step back, involuntarily. Junpei didn't budge, stared straight back at the Lotus. Does this have something to do with that field or whatever that is you mentioned? A field not visible to the eye. If more people knew the answer, then that information will pass through the field. Psst. Psych. Her manner shifted. She waved her hand dismissively, doing her best to laugh. I was kidding. You really shouldn't take me seriously. Well, I mean, the, th the things I did tell you are true. They really did happen. But the results really aren't anything to go by. They could have easily been falsified. In the end, I'm sure they were just in it for the ratings. They are a TV station, after all. At that, extra trivia with psychological studies and the like, there is something important with how data is collected in them, in that they try to rely as little as possible on what's called self-report data. Essentially, getting people's opinions. The idea is that since so many people's opinions on a matter vary wildly, and even with, within themselves, it doesn't exactly significantly matter. Morning, uh, morning Raptor, welcome. Hope you're doing well. <laughs> but yeah, due to, due to how unreliable memory tends to be, self-report data, in other words, people's views of something, aren't significant data to be able to draw a conclusion. As a result, there ends up being a whole lot of loopholing just to make sure that the people get the actual data that's statistically significant. It's complicated. Right. Man, I gotta admit, you had me there for a minute. I, uh, really thought you were serious about this funny Rinpa. Of course not. Like I told you, I'm sure it's just pseudoscience. Santa and Lotus laughed, gave one another jo jovial clasps on the shoulder. Junpei didn't feel so much like laughing, though. Something felt unclear. Enough nonsense. We've got the key. Let's go. Word. Lotus and Santa walked away from the picture, but Junpei stared, staring at the picture of the fun Yurimpa. A field not visible to the naked eye. Morphogenetics. The more he thought about it, the more his head hurt.
And with that, we have our puzzle room cleared. You found a Funyurimpa. They stepped through the door to find themselves in a wide hallway. The four of them stopped for a moment, looked at their surroundings. A short distance away, a metal grate extended across the width of the hallway. They took hold and shook, but it refused to move. Nearby was a pair of elevators. It only took a few button presses to determine that they wouldn't respond to their efforts. They could only assume the elevators weren't powered. There was only one door left. Guess we don't have much of a choice. Yeah. Sure does. Well, let's open it. Jinpei grabbed hold of, hold of the knob, pushed it open. The kitchen! I actually kind of like this room, and... I want to just mom moment to say... I like this area. I would say that this specific room is one of the better puzzles rooms of the game. If not for story reasons, then for some of the puzzles that we do. Because they're weird. He entered slowly, trying to take in as much of his surroundings as he could. The others followed shortly. Ah, kitchen. Santa didn't look pleased. What were you expecting? Well, isn't it obvious? The exit. I was hoping this would be the way out, but... <laughs> you really think it'd be that easy? Well, yeah, I know, still. Lotus headed deeper into the room. Stood in front of a door. If we can get through this door, we should come out the other side of that grate we saw earlier. Don't we need a key for that, though? Sorry, I guess that wasn't constructive. Neither of them looked happy. Junpei dug the ship map from his pocket and spread it out in front of him. As he did. Hey! What's that? Uh, oh, right, I forgot to tell you. I found this a little while ago. A map of the B-deck. Before Junpei could finish, Lotus snatched the map away. She ran her finger across it, muttered to herself, Knew it! Look! The three of them peered over the map. We came in here. Um, if we go out here, we should be on the other side of the grade. With her finger, Lotus traced a path. She was right. Satisfied she'd been correct, Lotus fo folded up the map, handed it back to Jinpei. He took it, slid the valuable piece of paper back into his pocket. There's a card reader on the right side of the door. Maybe we need a key card. Most likely, yeah. Alright, then let's get looking. Let's split up, search for clues. This almost feels like an episode of Scooby-Doo. Oh, you watched it as a kid? Yeah. Well, anyway. Seek some Scooby snacks. I mean, a way out. Of them. If you flip these fl plates over, they look like hats. Ah! <laughs> Thank you for the raid, King Narud and Raiders. Hope you're doing well. <laughs> Welcome to Synapse. And it's about time that we actually finally got a raid so I could say, yeah, I changed the raid music. I can't help it, okay? I'm a Streets of Rage nut. <laughs> but yeah, this is nine hours, nine doors, nine persons. Equal parts visual novel and escape the room puzzle game. Released for Nintendo DS, and there's also a re-release on Steam if anyone's interested. Currently, we're playing the DS version. Eventually, we're going to cover the Steam version thanks to some aid. But regardless. At least for right now, we need to find a whole bunch of things in this kitchen. Iron oven. Looks pretty heavy duty. It's probably industrial quality. I bet you could cook anything with this. If we could get it open seems to be locked. 
Okay, that's that door. What's in these pots? Oh, a pressure cooker. <laughs> Let's see how many people know what a pressure cooker is. What kind of idiot are you? You gonna run around holding this thing while you're looking for the dead? Hey, it was just a joke. Why so serious? How do I stream DS games? Um, through the use of an emu of an Emily. I'm just gonna be blunt on that one, cause DS and 3DS capture cards are for the most part out of production. You'd ha be pretty hard pressed to find one, let alone for cheap. So this is the next best means. It's taken a bit of meddling, but it's not terrible once you figure out how to properly use an emu uh, how to use an Emily. I thought you also have a bunch of choices for Emily's too, like, uh, there's the obvious, which is Desmume, but there's also, more, most recently, Melon DS as well. And I thought Melon DS also has a compatible core for RetroArch, if that's the route you wanted to go. Yeah, agreed on that one. I do happen to own a copy of this, well, technically my sister does. So it's not exactly too much of an issue to me. I bet drinking tea from this pot would be really yummy. Spending a day off with June drinking tea. I wonder if such a day could ever happen. Jumpy? Uh, nothing. We don't really need hot water, so maybe we should move on. Jeez! Ah, this is such a Gouda room. This is Gouda, the most famous Dutch cheese. If you don't cut open the casing, it usually won't go bad. You could store it at room temperature for quite a while. So we could eat this. Most likely. Not hungry, though. At all. I guess it's hard to get hungry in a situation like this. Well, there's something behind this wheel. Maybe we should move it. Huh, a green bottle. Full of oil. Make sure not to drink that. You might suffer a defense penalty and a cut to HP. Let's see who understands that reference. There's so much stuff here. A lot of cans. Maybe this is a pantry. If I remember correctly, I think we have everything we need from here. Bunch of instructions for using the cooking utensils. Nothing really suspicious about that. Nine plates look pretty expensive. Plates for appetizers. You know, appetizers usually come on square plates. Oh, okay. Well, excuse me, princess. Fifteen of these plates. I'm assuming they're for seafood. How the hell can you tell that? They look like any other plate from the 99 cent store. If you ever take a lady out to dinner, you're gonna embarrass yourself. I feel sorry for June. What? Uh, what? Why the hell are you bringing that up? The lady doth protest too much, methinks. You really... You are not terribly subtle. There's a bunch of little wavy ridges on the plate. Those plates are for meats. Ugh, you really are ignorant, aren't you? Come on, it's not like I need to know this crap. Jeez. Now, if I remember correctly, there's a code we need to input on this keypad, and... The place where it's hidden... I'm trying to remember where. Santa, can you open that door? What the hell? There's no way I could open that thing. Guess you're getting to that age where your eyes are starting to go, huh? You'd better watch your mouth, boy, or someone won't live long enough to see that di that door open. We got a rolling pin, a colander, nothing useful. Take the pipe, nothing special. 
This bolt is rusted in place. It won't budge. Oh, wait. Maybe if I put some oil on it. Uh, hey! A little bit, and... Come on, you little son of a bitch. <sighs> gotcha! You did it! You're so smart. <laughs> I can't believe they all go to play an escape room for free. <gasps> Funny you mentioned that. Um, If I remember correctly, back when the third of these games was released, they actually did make an escape, a mobile escape room of the original game that they took with them. Like, sorry, not that they didn't take with them. They just, they, it, Axis and whatnot hosted an event where you could actually play through a physical recreation of the original Nine Hours, Nine Doors, Nine Persons. They even gave out some memorabilia for the event, too. As Junpei walked into the room, a blast of cold air washed over him. Almost instinctively, he folded his arms tight across his chest, doing what he could to conserve body heat. Almost... Ugh, it's cold. What is this place? Are you blind? It's a freezer. Santa's teeth had already begun chattering. Hardly surprising. The freezer was far too cold for someone dressed as he was. Lotus was even in an even worse situation. Oh, no way. That's way too cold for me. I'll freeze solid in seconds. Sorry. I'm afraid I'll have to pass on this one. I'm gonna leave the rest to you. With that, she left the room. As she left, June came in. Oh, whoa. It, it's really cold in here. White puffs of steam hovered in front of their faces as they talked. Jun had already started to shiver. Hey, you don't need to be in here. You had fever just a little bit ago. You should stay outside. We've got this. I am fine. My fever's gone. That... Jinpei had scarcely opened his mouth when the sound of metal on metal rang behind them. They spun around to find the door had shut, leaving them trapped in the room. He grabbed hold of the doorknob. Ah! Ow! It was cold beyond cold. Merely touching it was painful. The doorknob, frozen shut. They deduced the pipe next to the door had ruptured. Water released by the rupture had hit the door and frozen instantly. Santa shoved Junpei aside, pounded against the door. Hey! Lotus! You're out there, right? Open the door! She wasted no time in responding. What do you want? What do you want? What's going on? The door won't open! Try opening it from that side! Please! <sighs> Fine. If you say so. Hold on. They could hear Lotus on the other side of the door, grunting. Then it ceased. They could hear panting, as if from exertion. It's no use. No parts. We've got more people in there. You'll figure it out. God damn it. Santa was shaking like a newborn deer. June was hugging herself, shivering violently. Even Junpei, with the heaviest clothes of any of them, was feeling the cold. With every breath they took, they could feel the cold work its way deeper and deeper into their bodies. Anyways, let's find a, a way out. If we don't get moving, we're gonna be p p permanent residents. Two heads are uh, better than none. We'll figure something out. Yeah, 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 yeah you're right. Let's just take a good look around the room. They pushed in close and began to search. There's some meat! <laughs> Let's take this hard meat. A chunk of pork. And in here... A chicken leg! Delicious chicken. What are it? Of course, we're need, gonna need some seasoning for this, but hey, at least it's something. And some dry ice. Junpei picked up the dry ice with his sleeves to avoid burning himself. Dry ice is just frozen carbon dioxide, isn't it? Yeah. 
wonder how warm it has to get for it to turn to gas. Hell if I know. How's that gonna help us anyway? Uh, well, I figured we might be able to use it to get out of here. They were about to move on when June spoke up. Carbon dioxide sublimation point is negative 109. Any warmer, and it'll turn into gas. Any lower, and it's solid. Junpei looked dumbfounded. How the hell do you know that? <laughs> Despite my looks, I'm the queen... Bleh. Sorry, queen of random knowledge. Looks bad to mess up when you're showing off. I could, uh, but the, uh. <sighs> so your mouth is so cold your mouth's going numb? Yes, that's right. You're just doing this on purpose, aren't you? <laughs> she tried to hide her guilt. At least she was feeling good enough to joke around, Junpei told herself. Himself. Come on, guys. Don't you think that's kind of weird? I wonder why it doesn't turn into a liquid at first. Santa was shivering at an astounding rate, but his curiosity was unaffected. Junpei wasn't in a mood to discuss science. I know the reason why, but we do we should probably go over it. It's specifically because standard temperature and pressure type things. Like, how the molecules are organized and everything. When it's a solid when it's a solid, it's very tightly packed. At standard temperature and is at standard pressure and going to the right temperature, there's no reason for it to stay compact. The cell, the little cells and whatnot are going to get enough energy that they splash out. Thus, sublimation. See, that's weird. Water's a liquid between 32 and 212. Why isn't that the case for carbon dioxide? Well, why would it be the case for carbon dioxide? Spin the question. It's a different mon- it's made of different molecules for the most part. It's got a different density. So of course, the rules would have to be different. There is a kind of ice that doesn't turn into a liquid when it goes above 32. I, uh, I've heard about it. Its melting point is 96. Ice with a melting point of 96. What, there's water that freezes at 96? Yeah. Well, you could also look at it as ice that won't melt until it's 96. Jinpei was cold as hell, but this was too interesting to ignore. He did his best to warm up by rubbing his arms, stamping his feet. Put the question to June. Okay, well, so what's it called? Ice Nine. Ice Nine? Oh uh, yeah, the good music. Originally, Ice Nine was a made-up substance invented by science fiction author. But recently, scientists have discovered that such a substance exists. Wait, hold up. So, is this thing called Ice Nine, or is it water? Like I said, if ice is over 96 degrees, it'll be liquid. If it's under, it'll solidify. Think of it as a polymorph of H2O. Think of it like diamonds and graphite. They're both made of carbon, but depending on the structure of the crystallization and the har the hardness and... But depending on the structure of the crystallization and the pressure that's under, the hardness and structure are different. So you're saying normal water and this ice nine are like that? Yeah. Have you heard the story about the crystallization of glycerin? For 150 years after the discovery, people cooled it, warmed it, did all sorts of things to it. But whatever they did, it never crystallized. Then one day in 1920, that some glycerin en route to England by ship was crystallized during the trip. Scientists worldwide wanted to research it and began asking for samples of the seed. You know, a, a sample of the original substance. With seed crystal, further crystallization of glycerin would be simple. But something weird happened. The glycerin encouraged by seed crystals crystallized nearby samples as well. And it didn't end there. 
all glycerin in the world after that day crystallized naturally at less than 64 degrees. Before that day, no matter how glycerin was cooled, it refused to crystallize. But after it had begun once, it was almost like, uh, how do I put it? Almost like all the glycerin in the world was communicating. Communicating in some way we can't sense. Maybe morphogenetically? It was a pretty interesting story. That, we, it, that's weird, but what does that have to do with Ice Nine? To his surprise, it was Santa and not June who answered. What she's saying is it's a lot like Ice Nine. You know, what happened? A lot like it? That would be bad. If water everywhere started freezing at 96, hey, I bet it'd be, the, it'd be the end of the world. Junpei felt that Santa might not be treating the idea of the end of the world with the proper concern. At any rate, we're not going to have to worry about the end of the world unless we can get out of here pretty damn quick. He was right. Junpei shivered. Alright guys, I think that's enough of that. Didn't think we could get this far off topic. I mean, I know I'm kind of fall here, but we can't be screwing around anymore. Seriously. I might go by the name Santa, but I didn't grow up in Iceland. Freaking hate the cold. Let's get cracking. We gotta find a way out of here. Santa stopped off, clearly doing his best to pretend the cold wasn't affecting him. Selfish, isn't he? Still, he was right. It was high time they got back to their search. The story of Ice Nine, while interesting, could be thought about once they left the freezer. Such, I believe we're still missing something. Maybe in here? Some dope rope. And a bottle. We've got everything. Now, something you might be not be aware of about the sublimation process. Can't you make that stuff cause an explosion if you, like, seal it in something that's airtight? Yeah, didn't you do that, that stuff in school? Never underestimate the power of expanding gas. After all, a sudden change in temperature and pressure can cause a lot of things. It can cause a lot of things to happen. Fires, for example, are caused by introducing a lot of energy rapidly to anything made of carbon, for an example. So what if we were to take this dry ice and mash it up? You might be thinking how you might do that. Say it again. It's really hard. Again. It's really hard. Thanks. Something wrong, Jinpei? Your face is red. Nothing. I'm fine. If it's that hard, you could probably use it as a hammer. Good point. Maybe we could use it to break something. How is the ice dry? Well, honestly, dry ice is a misnomer. There's technically no water in dry ice whatsoever. It's called as such simply because, like, uh, it lacks H2O. It sounds dumb. It is dumb. Alright. Put these pieces of dry ice into the water bottle. Seal that up. And let's tie a rope on here. Hey, why don't we use that rope to tie the bottle on the doorknob? We just have to put some water in it, then we can give it a good whack with something. Then, kaboom! It'll explode, break the ice at the door. Then what are we waiting for? I can't take this cold any longer. Warm water dripped from the ruptured pipe near the door. Jinpei pulled out the water bottle filled with dry ice. Let a good amount of water fall in, and sealed it up. The makeshift bomb complete. He tied it to the doorknob as quickly as he could manage in the cold. 
Yes, actually. The door froze open. The, the door froze, essentially. So we're trying to jury rig a solution to get out. MacGyver, if you will. So, uh, what do we do now? Just need to give it a little, uh, tap. Bottle's already about to pop. If we just throw a rock or something, it'll go off on its own. A small rock? Uh. Oh, toy. Dry ice. This ought to do the trick. He pulled the sleeve down over his hand to keep from getting burned. Grabbed the chunk. It was a pretty good size. About as big as a pool ball. He figured it'd be just the right size and give just the right amount of energy. Alright, stand back. Actually, we should hide somewhere. Santa and June looked at him with concern. And where do you expect us to hide, genius? There isn't anywhere big enough. Yeah, there is. Look, right here. You can hide in there. Junpei pulled open the door to the cellar. Come on, get inside. They nodded, jumped down into the hole. Junpei followed. In his hand, he could feel the chill of the frozen carbon dioxide, even through his sleeve. He tightened his grip, took aim, and threw. Here goes! Three, four, five... You're counting the wrong way! Uh, that is a really sad excuse for a joke, man. Sorry. Right, for real this time. Just throw the damn thing. Three, two, one! With the same motion that he threw, he ducked down into the cellar. Junpei leapt up, ran to the door. Jumpy! The ice! It's gone! Get the blast must have shattered it! Let's get out of here! 